So hi, this is a uh, lecture video for interrupt latency for EC153 week 5. So the coverage of this video lecture will be on defining what is an interrupt, what is the interrupt latency, and then of course calculating the interrupt latency and some techniques to reduce the latency. So what is an interrupt? What is the interrupt latency? So it is the time since the occurrence of the interrupt event until the interrupt is completely serviced. So basically whenever, for example, for a change notification interrupt, the time since I press the button till the time that my microcontroller realizes that I've actually pressed the button. So this is usually split into two parts. So first is uh, from the occurrence of the event to before the start of the ISR. So basically, uh, from the occurrence of the event up to the point when our microcontroller realizes that an interrupt occurred. And then the other part is the actual servicing of the interrupt. So the number of instruction cycles needed or used by the ISR. So for at this point of the course, we don't actually have much control over this. So we will be mainly focusing on this second part. So in other words, uh, this is actually also called the ISR overhead. And then we can define it first in terms of instructions or clock cycles. So given that our MIPS, uh, our PIC32 is using a pipeline MIPS architecture, uh, each instruction is uh, approximately one clock cycle, so we can use them interchangeably. So uh, if, uh, if you are already familiar with interrupts, it has three parts. So that is the entry or the prologue instructions. So this is your context safe. And then the instruction body, wherein what we're actually, what the ISR actually is doing. And then lastly is the epilogue instructions or the exit instructions or the context restore instructions. So all these three, we just add them together and we get the ISR overhead in terms of instructions or clock cycles. So another way of representing ISR overhead is as a percentage of CPU time. So we have the number of instructions ISR from the previous slide, we multiply it with FISR, which is the uh, amount of times the ISR is triggered per second. And then we divide this with the total instructions or clock cycles per second of our microcontroller. So this gives us an estimate of how much of the CPU processing time is actually used for the interrupts. So we want uh, if our ISR is, let's say, 50%, that means half the time the our CPU is actually, uh, our, uh, our CPU is actually servicing interrupts rather than performing its main routine. So what are some implications of these numbers? So if we have a high instruction count, obviously we will be having a high latency. And then a higher ISR percentage means we have more time spent on ISRs and less on the quote-unquote important stuff our CPU should be doing. So given also the equation for ISR percentage, it doesn't necessarily meet, it doesn't necessarily require a high interrupt latency. So if our ISRs actually occur very often, even if our even if the ISR itself is quite short. It can, still, it can still lead to a high RSR percentage. So ideally, we want both the latency and our overhead to be minimal. So uh, let's have an example with input debouncing. So we create a code wherein each positive edge on bit zero of input port A will toggle bit zero of output port B. So basically a button press triggering, toggling the output of our microcontroller. 
So our input is from a mechanical switch, which has a bounce time of 5 milliseconds. So for those unfamiliar, switch bouncing occurs when whenever we press a mechanical switch, our contacts don't necessarily uh, get in contact with each other immediately. So because it's a mechanical thing, uh, some bouncing of the contacts will occur and after a certain period, that is the only time that we can be sure that our input is stable. So what we want to do is we can use the change notification interrupt, which occurs at the time the switch is activated. And within the interrupt, we wait for a certain amount of time, in this case, 5 milliseconds. And then after that, we check for the output state of our uh, of our input to verify if our button or if our input was indeed a legitimate press and not just some random noise. So I've already made it here. So we assume that port A and port B are properly configured and all interrupt SFRs are properly configured. So here I'm using the software registers or CNISR. So first we are we should disable the interrupt and then check if it's a positive edge change notification. So since it's a change notification, if our input is already high, it means that it went from a low state. And after verifying that we introduce a delay of 5 milliseconds, which we assume is defined elsewhere in our code. May It could be just a subroutine doing no operations for 5 milliseconds and then returning to the main subroutine, or in this case, the ISR. And then after the delay, if port A is still high, it is a uh, verified button press and we toggle port B. Otherwise, we do nothing. And then after that, we say the interrupt has been serviced by uh, clearing the interrupt flag and then enabling the interrupt again. So in this case, if we break it down, our instructions needed for entry, it's typically for epic 32. It's around 19. And then... Uh, this will also change depending on what your uh, interrupt is doing, but for in this case, it would be 19. And then for our body, we have one, two, three instructions, then a delay of five milliseconds, and then one, two, and three more instructions after that. So six plus the instruction count of the delay. And then for our exit instructions, it's typically 40 for the pick 32 and X. So uh, let's first calculate for the instruction count for the delay. So assuming a system clock of 60 megahertz, uh, in order to get the five millisecond delay, I need 300,000 instructions or 300,000 clock cycles. So adding them up, Adding them all up together, we can estimate actually that the uh, instruction count for the ISR is around 300,000 as well. So that's actually quite large and we would want to reduce that. So the first way we can reduce the latency is through the use of a semaphore or uh, in other words, a flag, if you search it online, it's just a fancy way of saying flags. So for uh, when we want to use semaphores, our ISR is relegated for to just setting the flag, and then our main code would do the actual work. So how does that look like? So our interrupt service routine, our ISR, would just be this short. So it's just disabling the interrupt, uh, uh, clearing the flag, and then checking for the positive edge in the change notice. If it is a positive edge, we set our semaphore 
part A pressed to true, which is initially false here. So we declare this as a global static volatile Boolean variable over here. So inside our main loop, uh, of course, you have your configuration set up here. And then if we check that our semaphore port A pressed is true, we, me, we then introduce the delay of 5 milliseconds. And then after that, we will be checking if our port A is still pressed and then toggling port B if it is so. Then after that, it uh, we clear the flag again in case it was set again during the time after we set the semaphore to when we service it, and then uh, enabling the interrupt once more. And then of course, we set the semaphore to false since we already acknowledged it. So in this case, our interrupt body has one, two, three, four instructions. Uh, we uh, set the return as included in the exit instructions, actually. So in this case, we can say the instruction count of our ISR is 19 plus 4 plus 40, which is 63. So which should be significantly less than our previous 300,000. So in case you were wondering, static here means that our variable is our variable scope is limited to our current project and the volatile keyword makes sure that our compiler doesn't take shortcuts in the assignment so what does that mean as a little segue if i hit if i have here a static integer i zero which is up my semaphore for example if at the start of my function i set it as one and then I have part of my code that doesn't affect i, and then set it to 2 in this case. Uh, this could be, for example, a change in state, or whenever, uh, when this i is a semaphore used by other functions, it might be relevant that it I have been able to set it as i equals 1 here, even though my code itself doesn't use it. So if I don't put the volatile keyword, the compiler will consider this unnecessary and it might remove it. So it's actually fairly important, especially if we're using semaphores and ISRs. So another way of reducing latency, which you may have been already acquainted with, is the shadow registers. So it's a dedicated set of registers used to save the current context. So we enable this in PIC32 by adding SRS in the declaration. Uh, so instead of using soft, we use SRS. So typically, we save two instructions and three instructions for the prologue and epilogue, respectively. But this might differ depending on the per uh, depending on what your ISR is actually doing, since the compiler adds its own way of optimization your code optimization in your code as well. So in our previous example, I just set this as SRS. And then our body would have, our entry will be uh, 17 cycles instead of 19. And our exit will have 37 cycles instead of 40. So adding them all up, 58 clock cycles. So we were able to shave off around 5 clock cycles, which isn't a big thing, but if, for example, this is an ISR that occurs very often, it still reduces our overhead, or it's still valuable re reduction in the ISR overhead. Then lastly, if we want to have a low uh, latency, is we can program in assembly. So we can streamline the saving and restoring of registers, and then we can even block off certain registers and uh, and make it so that the ISR uses those registers and our other routines don't use those registers anymore. So we don't have to save and restore the context. So this would be the assembly code if we want to 
save and restore uh, the all the registers. And if we compare this to the case where we use a dedicated set, you can see that they are significantly reduced. But of course, it's in assembly, which me, which is very very tedious. So uh, this is only recommended if, for example, you already have a your your fun, you already have a good program and you're just trying to get the most out of it. So in summary, the interrupt latency gives us a rough evaluation of how good we service an interrupt. So ideally, both interrupt latency and ISR overhead should be kept at a minimum because uh, our CPU is a very busy guy. So we want to interrupt it as less as we can. And then lastly, we can introduce software tweaks such as semaphores and additional hardware such as shadow registers to provide ways to improve interrupt latency. Of course, there could be other ways out there, but for the PIC32, this is what we can do. So that is the end of the presentation. Thank you for your time.